right. One second. Okay, that's different. Not sure I like it. Let's get started. So recently we had a look into a game called No More Heroes, a fairly fun and interesting hack and slash game that was riddled with a few issues, as I said at the time though there was a sequel for the game and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So the story is set three years after the events of the first game, Travis as you know had made his way to the highest rank assassin within the UAA, but over the three years he managed to walk away giving himself the title of the crownless king. Until now that is. The game starts off with Travis being challenged by another assassin for revenge, and similar to the first game, it will throw you straight into the main part of the game. However, instead of making your way through some hallways towards the boss, the game will just immediately start you with a boss fight instead, while the tutorial plays out over the first part of the fight. The combat itself is fairly similar to the first game with the basic swings from the A button. By tilting the Wiimote up and down, you can set between a heavy and light attack, but if you shake the Wiimote, Travis will lunge towards the enemy you've got currently targeted, and overall, the combat just feels more responsive this time round. Travis doesn't seem to freak out over the position of the Wiimote and hits don't feel delayed either but best of all they've changed the way the battery works so instead of every hit and block draining the saber you'll only end up losing charge when you're blocking and performing a lunge attack so it's very rare that you need to charge the saber throughout the game especially if you're using the dodge mechanic properly so I mentioned briefly that in the first game you get these random special abilities during a fight and these do return in the sequel but they're not random anymore you can activate them when you want Kind of. You have to do enough damage to activate the special meter, but this means you can just save it for the bosses and uh... Yeah, it becomes quite sad. Another thing to note with this game as well is that you can actually play No More Heroes 2 with a Wii controller attachment instead of the Wiimote and Nunchuck. Unfortunately I don't have this controller so I have no idea if it plays any better, but the Wiimote and Nunchuck are fine for me for the most of it, so I'm just going to stick with that. One thing I did notice immediately and soon began to hate was the camera controls in this game. In the first game they were a bit more locked and pretty tightly synced with how stiff Travis felt in the game, however in the sequel both are an absolute nightmare at times. The camera is a little bit too shaky and sometimes it's really hard to see what I'm focusing Sing on or actually doing because the camera is caught in an area that I can't move it around in. So a basic way to round that up is the camera sucks. During the first boss fight you'll be taking out the fight briefly to a cutscene that you'll keep going back to throughout the game, where you'll be speaking to a woman on the phone which I can only imagine being a peep show. This video is getting demonetized isn't it? I can feel it now, any second. These are very similar to what the first game did when it pulls you to a halt as Sylvia calls you up to let you know the next fight is coming up. But instead of the sentence being the same sentence 10 times in a row throughout the game, this actually gives a bit of context to the plot while also pleasing some other people's, um, fantasies. So once that's out of the way and you've ended up beating the boss, you'll end up beheading him where he will then somehow survive it for a moment just to warn you that your actions have consequences and that Travis is about to lose someone close to him. Upon hearing this though, I had no idea who this would be unless they were planning on killing off Sylvia, but she's with Travis at this point in time, so I have no idea who it is. Well, it actually turns out that the video rental guy from the first game, yeah, you know, that guy, the guy with the most backstory in the game, him, apparently is important to Travis. Does that man even have a name? Bishop! Huh. So upon Bishop's head being seen in a bag, Travis will then devote the rest of the game to kill the person who killed his friend. Fortunately enough though, the assassin who killed Bishop was ranked first within the UAA. And what's even better is that guy you killed earlier? Yeah, he was ranked 51 in the UAA. Meaning there's a total of 50 bosses in this game. Right, that's it. This is going to be a long one, isn't it? So once coming to terms with the massive journey you have ahead of you, you'll end up heading back to the motel, and similar to the first game, this will act as your hub area, giving you an option to save, while also having some other little options as well. Just like the first game, you can change your clothing once it's been purchased from a store, there's also a television like in the first game where you can watch... Or whatever that is. But you can also play a mini game there as well. But there is actually some other things which are new which you can interact with around the room. You've got the wrestling magazines which will be provided throughout the game, which unlock you more grab moves similar to the first game with the masks. But there's also your cat. She got fat. So throughout the game you'll have the chance to exercise Jean so she can lose some weight. But you'll also need to feed her as well, otherwise she'll be too grumpy to play. 
and also that would be a bad thing to do because your pet would die and you'd be an asshole. Well, once you've done everything you can, you can just walk out the front door and leave, where instead of the open world, you'll be greeted with a menu which you can go to various other places throughout the city. And while some will call this a step backwards, I'd rather have this over the hub world that we had from the first game. Sure, there's no free roam anymore, but it's better to have a world that justifies the feature and no more heroes free roam area was pretty awful. As for what you can do this time around, you can do the same as before really. You can buy new clothes or you can head over to the lab and buy two of the four new weapons this game has to offer or you could go to the gym and level up Travis giving you more health and damage or you could go to some jobs again similar to the first game. Although it's worth mentioning there's a few differences when it comes to these jobs. First off though you won't be able to unlock any first rank jobs from completing these basic jobs. It seems a step backwards but that's what they went with. You'll have a total of 8 jobs on offer and I'll be honest, they're rather underwhelming. This time round all but one of them are actually 2D based pixel mini games, trying to represent the games from the NES and SNES era, but the challenge they provide is rather inconsistent and honestly gets rather boring. You'll start off with one of the better jobs being bug out where you'll have to go through a few stages picking up every bug mouse scorpion on the stage before progressing. It's pretty basic but the main complaint here is the hitbox are rather inconsistent. Next is Layer the Pipe, a basic puzzle game where you have to connect pipes from one side to the other before the water leaks out. It's challenging at first but these sequences are always the same. Then there's Coconut Grabber, it's a more repetitive and irritating version compared to the original game. And then there's Pizza with Avengers, and this is actually rather fun. It reminds me of the old Road Raid game slightly, where you'll be travelling down a road on a bike trying to make a delivery before the time runs out. It's nothing special, but it's fun compared to the rest. And then there's the worst of the bunch, Man the Meat. I have nothing to say about this one, it's just terrible avoidant. After that you got Tile in Style, or as I like to call it, Poor Man's Tetris. And after that you head into space with Getting Trashed, which involves you picking up trash but is in space. And finally, there's Sting So Good. Now immediately you'll notice this job is from the first game, and it is, almost exactly from the first game, but somehow they've made it worse than the original game and it's for one simple reason. It's due to how Travis moves in this game, He's a lot more floaty this time round rather than being stiff and stopping immediately, and with how the minigame works in this game you have to be so precise when picking up a scorpion, otherwise you'll just fuck it up and then you'll get poisoned. Travis, could you just... Could you just... For God's sake, man, move! It's such a shame that they managed to make this minigame worse than the original, and overall the part-time jobs in this game have just become really underwhelming compared to the first game. Not to say they're unplayable, but they don't really feel as fun or rewarding to play. As compared to the first game, the payouts on these jobs are very little in comparison. But there is a reason to why. In the first game you had to pay to challenge the next assassin and these would be rather expensive, but in No More Heroes 2 you can just do them immediately, which is actually rather surprising as you could just go and take them all on and forget about all the side stuff, but I definitely wouldn't suggest it. Like I said before, there's still stuff you can buy with cash being two new weapons for Travis, some cosmetics and then finally upgrades for your character. The cosmetic side of things I didn't really pay much attention to besides buying the original outfit. As for the weapons I only managed to get the first weapon out of the two because the second one cost way more and I didn't like the idea of grinding through these jobs to get cash. Compared to the first game though, the new weapons you unlock for Travis actually feel rather different and unique. You'll start off with the signature saber, but you'll be able to purchase the last saber from the first game being the katana, which actually feels really good. And then there's a second saber you can purchase, which is a more slow and heavy focused saber, or that's what I've read. There is also the fourth saber that you'll unlock by just progressing through the game, and it ended up being my favourite out of the bunch, which is the twin blades. From playing with all three weapons, I'll definitely say the twin blades are weaker, but they're definitely faster, and I honestly prefer it that way. But something I did notice about all three weapons so far, is that you can't upgrade them, like, at all. Once you buy the weapon, that's it. I guess they're expensive because you get what you're given, but it's weird that the first game allowed them to be upgraded and then they've just taken that feature out of the second one. It could possibly be due to the beams being more focused on blocking, reducing the overall need to upgrade its capacity, or it could just be due to how the damage is upgraded from the gym. And let me just say, the gym is by far my least favourite part of this game. So just like the first game, you can use the gym to upgrade certain attributes for Travis, and you'll have to pay some money and then perform a little mini game. However, compared to the first game, while they were stupidly easy in the first game, they're now just tedious and awful. In the gym you get two options to choose from, either upgrading your health or upgrading your damage. Upgrading your health is by doing a treadmill minigame with the most uncomfortable controls I've ever encountered in a running game, but it is definitely doable. As for damage however, yeah this is where I started to get a little bit pissy with the game. So you'll have to punch and kick a few weights away that are being thrown at you whilst dodging some love hearts. It's a pretty simple control layout, A is to punch, B is to kick and down on the nunchuck is to dodge. But the problem I noticed with this is the delay in hits, meaning you have to be very precise when making a move 
otherwise you'll mess it up and if you mess up more than once or twice in two sequences you'll end up failing and you have to do it all again but to do it again you have to pay for it again and each time you level up it costs more and more and the best part of all which is what I absolutely despise about this part it's completely RNG whether the weight is being thrown high or low. So I spent most of my money trying to do the final damage level and you know what? I still haven't done it. I refused to waste any more money on it and I had to beat the game without the last little bit of damage. But you know what? I've done enough and I think I should be fine for the rest of the game so I'm just going to get on with it and challenge the next assassin. As you can expect the structure of this game is fairly similar to the first game with you progressing through a hall of enemies and fighting the boss. But it only happens sometimes, it gets rather weird. So in the first game you always had that simple structure of going through a location killing a bunch of enemies with a slight twist like being on a bike stuck on a side camera view or playing with a baseball but in No More Heroes 2 you don't even get that sometimes one of them is just driving to a location and then that's it and it's not a short segment this part actually drags on a bit too long but that seems to be a pattern in this game some areas are just one long hallway with a couple of enemies to kill while another one was based outside a shopping center and I was sitting there for several minutes where I had to kill almost a never-ending swarm of enemies as for the bosses this time round though they're pretty similar to the first game however sometimes they don't make any sense because they're from another universe but after you fight the first boss who is honestly rather generic you notice things get a little bit different the next boss in the game will see you fighting in a mech suit from what i assume is a gundam reference but instead of being one assassin in this boss you'll end up fighting your way through half of the rank in this game which i mean isn't a massive deal because fighting 50 different bosses would have been a nightmare to beat this game but the back of the case says 50 unique assassins so it does feel a little bit cheap and this isn't even the only time it happens because later on in the game you'll get another bunch of assassins killed off screen in a battle royale yes you heard me a fucking battle royale. Don't get me wrong though, the bosses you actually fight in this game are rather decent and there's still plenty to go around. But why would you state that there's 50 in the game when a bunch of them are going to be killed off screen? In all honesty, it doesn't make any sense and it just makes it sound like the game was rushed. But to be completely blunt, when comparing these bosses overall to the first game, I'm sorry but the original bosses were much better and honestly more memorable. A big part of the build up towards the next boss fight is the cutscene introducing them to Travis and it gives a slight insight into the personality of the assassin you'll be fighting, but they've skipped that with some of the bosses in this game. Instead you'll get a cutscene with little to no interaction between them and Travis. For example, there's a boss fight later on in this game where you'll turn up on your bike and then you just drive at each other. And that's the cutscene. You'll start off fighting on bikes, which, yeah, the driving didn't get any better in this game, where you'll attempt to knock each other off the side of the cliff, and then it just returns to being a normal generic boss fight. And honestly, this was the worst fight out of them all, because this character has no background to him at all. There's nothing about him, he's just kind of there on this cliffside, and then you just fight him. Now, that's the worst example I could give. I'm not saying that all the bosses in this game are bad, but there's some bosses that are actually rather fun. There's Captain Vladimir, an astronaut trapped in some sort of limbo filed in a crop circle, Alice Twilight, who reminds me of Dr. Octopus, and hell, even Destroy Man's back. Yeah, you fight Destroy Man later on in this game, but he's two people instead of one after being split in half. And yeah, just like before, he's still rather easy. But unlike the first game, you don't actually fight Destroy Man as Travis, instead you fight them as Shinobu. Yeah, you actually get to play as a couple of characters this time round. At the halfway point of the game, you'll find out that Shinobu has agreed to help take down two of the higher ranked assassins to help Travis get to the first rank quicker. But instead of being a cutscene, you'll actually get the two levels to play as Shinobu. Unlike Travis though, she has her own set of abilities. She can't grab anyone anymore, but she can jump and perform her own air attacks and hold down a light attack button to perform a long distance attack. Thankfully, Shinobu feels different enough to make her own levels stand out compared to Travis's, but there were two points in the level which I actually hated and ended up making me hate playing Shinobu. And both of them included some god awful platforming. Seriously, I got stuck in a vault for about 10 minutes trying to jump up to a higher level, especially in the second level where there's an open warehouse where you have to travel across the entire map to jump up some platforms, and then run all the way back, and if you fall off, yeah, you're gonna have to do it all again, and it's not fun. Although, killing Destroyman made all that rage a bit worthwhile. After a couple more bosses though, you'll actually get a chance to play as Travis's brother Henry, but his boss isn't really towards the rank 5, as he's currently dreaming and fights a small anime girl in a mech suit. You know, I didn't really expect my day to be killing a child. Sadly though, Henry only gets this small section which is just one boss fight, and then he just leaves and kills two more bosses outside the cutscene. Oh, are you fucking kidding me? Seriously, again? And from that point, there's not a lot left to do. There's a couple more boss fights before confronting the person who killed your friend Bishop, and you'll end up fighting your way through a rather big building, fighting too many enemies before confronting the final boss, which once again, 
it was ridiculously easy. After you've done that and got your revenge, the game will end and then that's it. You'll find out who's been narrating throughout the entire game, and if it wasn't already obvious, it's Sylvia. There is a slight hint at a sequel though when Travis mentions that Santa Destroyed needs them, and then the game will just throw you back to the main menu. But as before, there's an extra difficulty along with the new game plus. But there's also a little bit more. There's also a deathmatch mode where you can pick a fight from any of the bosses you fought throughout the game, but sadly there's nothing special about this mode. It's similar to a time trial mode, see how fast you can beat the boss and then try to beat your own record. It's a fun addition for the end game content, but half of these bosses honestly don't really need revisiting as they weren't all that great the first time round. Now you might be smug and think, oh Ben's missed something out, I'm going to call him a twat in the comments, but don't worry, I do know I missed it and there's a very dumb reason to why. So after completing the game and doing some research on the bosses, I soon discovered that I'd actually missed a secret boss during my playthrough, and also some extra missions. These extra missions are called revenge missions, and I believe they unlock after every two bosses. The objective of these is to hunt down the people who killed Bishop while you work on your way to the top. These aren't anything special, and they aren't all that hard, but if you want to make a completionist run, you will need to find all the items that these have in the level, and you can only do these once. Once you've beaten it, that's it, it ends and you can't come back to it. As for the extra boss though, well after you finish beating the Jock and his cheerleaders in a mech suit, leave your motel and then head straight back in. You'll get a call from the UAA that someone is challenging you for your rank. This will then take over your next boss option, so you'll have to beat this person before you can actually progress with the rest of the game. And honestly, I actually think this is a really cool idea. It's just poorly executed. It would have been fun if you get this throughout the game with random people challenging you like a couple of bosses while you're progressing through the main game, but sadly this is the only time it'll ever happen, and I bet the majority of you actually missed this on your first run through. Just like the revenge missions, this game expects you to keep going back to the motel after each each match just in case you want to save or something. But I never once travelled back to the motel as there was no reason to. Maybe they should have had it like the first game where to progress to the next rank you had to go back to the motel to find out where to go next. But sadly they didn't and it just ended up being a fun idea that was poorly executed. So that was No More Heroes 2 for the Nintendo Wii. It's an alright sequel but the first game is still better in my eyes. Sure it's flawed in various areas and the sequel does improve upon it but the areas that were really good in the first game were actually a little bit less satisfying in the sequel. As for the Switch version however, well that's coming out in a couple of days so we'll have to go and have a look, so you can expect what's coming next. But until then, thank you all so much for watching, my name is Sir Crackerbob, and have a cracking week. Goodbye.